Good evening. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm really glad that you guys are here. Um, I know that things are starting to intensify with school and with your course load. Things are getting a little bit more stressful. Um, a lot of people are sick, and there's just a lot of demands on your time. And I know that every time that I see you guys come pouring in um, for Catalyst, it just delights my heart. Um, because seeing you guys taking um, some time out of the middle of your week to come and to hear God's word and to worship together is just such an encouragement. Um, I share that with other people all the time, and I think that it just shows that you guys really are working at keeping Christ first in all things. And so I just wanted to commend you for that and thank you for that. Also, um, we you probably saw all the staff like dashing for the door. Nothing was wrong. Everything was fine. Um, but I don't know that we've ever really told you before Catalyst, we always pray together. Um, we pray over whoever's speaking. We pray for you guys, that your hearts would be fertile soil for God's word. So that's kind of what that was about. So you don't usually see it in Havener because it's in the back of the room. But when it's here, it's like all the staff are running for the exit. Did we miss something? No. I mean, if you wanted to come pray with us, you're welcome to. But that's what's happening. But while we were out there, um, Andy called Nathaniel from his wife Amy's phone. And for those of you that are like, who's this Andy person? Because you weren't here last spring. Um, Andy was our senior campus minister. He'd been with us for like seven years. Um, he's now a senior pastor at a church in Florida. And our text bombs are our ways of loving people overwhelmingly. Because you get texts from people you do and that you don't know. Um, we did it to Nathaniel after he had done an internship with us. And was it an hour that your phone was buzzing, receiving messages? Because he had a dumb phone. He didn't even have a smartphone. And uh, so he hated us but loved us. He got a text from Andy that said, sorry, and then this onslaught of texts. So that's what that's about. That's a way that we like to love people. Um, so if that ever happens to happen to you, just grin and bear it, I guess. <laughs> Don't feel like you have to respond. Um, so I also love a good Laffy Taffy joke. Uh, where are my fellow Laffy Taffy joke lovers? Or puns or memes? Anything that's short and sweet and snarky, right? Okay. <clears throat> so after Catalyst, um, shared a couple of jokes or heard a couple of jokes, had a few laughs, so I wanted to start out tonight with a couple that I found that I hope that you'll appreciate. So, why was the cat afraid of the tree? Because of its bark, yes. Um, what do you call a fish with two knees? A toonie fish. <laughs> why are fishermen greedy? Because their job makes them sell fish. Right, okay. Thank you, thank you. I worked really hard Googling those. So in the vein of selfishness, that's actually what we're going to be talking about. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to use the YouVersion app to find um, the rest of the scripture we're going to be talking about, as well as some of the main points from tonight, you can go ahead and um, open your app and you can go to events and click on this. And then if you can save it, you can refer back to it, take notes, whatever the case may be. Um, so tonight we're going to hear from Paul about being selfless for the glory of God and the salvation of others. So I basically just summed the whole sermon up in that line. But we're going to spend the rest of the night unpacking that. So if you guys would just pray with me, and then we'll jump into our text. Precious Father, God, I just want to thank you for your grace, um, for your faithfulness, and for your mercy. Um, God, I thank you that you sent your son, that he left heaven, that he left your presence um, to come and live a life, um, to die a death, um, to defeat death, um, so that we could have a restored relationship with you. And God, I ask that we wouldn't take that lightly, um, that that would um, impact everything that we do in our life, um, and that we would truly live in a way that is honoring the sacrifice that you made um, because of our passionate love for you. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Now, I need to open my Bible to the text because I forgot to do that myself. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, read with me verses 21 through chapter 11, verse 1. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbors. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. 
for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to go to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So since we've been in 1 Corinthians, a lot of this is probably pretty familiar to you. And there's a reason for that, because Paul is actually boomeranging back around to continue answering or to complete answering a question that he actually started answering back in chapter 8 when Chris preached last semester. Um, so the church in class, they had a question that Paul wanted to take deeper. Um, and I like to look at that kind of as a leaves versus root thing. So they were asking this question that was like, hey, can we eat this meat sacrifice to idols? Which is a legit question um, for their culture, for their community, wanting to make sure that they were living in a way that was honoring and glorifying to God. But Paul's like, hey, that actually opens a door to a much deeper conversation. So I'll answer that question, but then let's really explore what is behind that question. And then I'll continue answering the question that you just asked. So that's what's happening here. So he, they say, can we eat meat sacrificed to idols? I would say that a modern day comparison would be, can I drink alcohol? Um, is it okay for me to watch this movie? Um, is it okay for me to kiss before marriage or to X, Y, and Z? So simply put, Paul is saying, yes, unless it becomes a stumbling block. Um, so I kind of wanted to share with you guys a little bit about being willing to sacrifice your liberty if it's not helpful or it doesn't build up. And for me, one of the best examples of this is the times that I've gone on some missions trips. Um, how many of you guys have been on a missions trip to another culture, maybe? Even if it's within the country, sometimes like it's maybe a little bit different than where you are. Yeah? Okay, so have they ever asked you to do something that's maybe a little outside of the norm? Wear a shirt without logos, right? Or if you're working in the inner city, maybe not wearing bandanas specifically of a certain color, right? Or for women, wearing skirts or pants instead of shorts or capris or whatever the case may be. Um, wearing loose clothing instead of stuff that's, that's tight or um, taking a break from social media. Um, some, the trip that my husband and I took to India, they asked us to kind of, hey, like, and not that we were being overly PDA while we were there, but before we left, they're like, make sure that you keep that kind of on lockdown because that's something that is very sensitive in the culture. They're not really open about their PDA. Um, and it's the same thing when I went to Cambodia. There were things that I needed to sacrifice about the way I live my life, even though it was incredibly hot and I was literally melting the entire time because I respect the people there and I did not want to give an offense, some sort of a barrier between them seeing Christ and me, I would wear whatever was necessary to prevent from offending them so they could see Christ in me instead of offense and me first. So the purpose of this wasn't to make me feel ashamed. It wasn't to hinder my relationship with my husband or to inhibit me. It was to remove the stumbling block. And if you'll remember, Chris said, and I'm going to kind of summarize his sermon, but it's fantastic, and if you missed it, you should hop on our YouTube channel and listen to it. He said, love builds up, and when it comes to Christian liberty, we are to practice restraint and humble deference. And I'm going to hang on to that for a while because that was so good. So perhaps this means that you need to make some decisions differently. Maybe it's a decision you need to make differently for just a moment. So just this one time that you're out to eat with these people, knowing that they really have a problem with whatever it is, it kind of maybe impacts what it is that you order while you're at the restaurant. Maybe it's something that's for a season. Like when I was on this missions trip, it impacted what I put in my suitcase. You know, it impacted the things that I did while I was there. Um, maybe it's something that is going to impact your life indefinitely. And maybe it means willing to give up something completely or to change something completely for the sake of the gospel. So the section between chapters 8 and 10, 23, where we pick up our text tonight, Paul is fleshing out and showing them ways that he himself has surrendered his rights and disciplined himself for the sake of the gospel. But I want to reread our emphasis text for tonight, which is verse 23 and 24, and then 31 through 11, 1. All things are lawful. 
but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And I want to pause here for just a second because when I go, well, who is my neighbor? Like, what category of people is it that I should actually take into consideration changing the way that I live my life, right? And, I, you know, you kind of laugh at it. You're like, well, that's kind of a stupid question. But that's what we actually ask is like, well, but it's my right. I'm 21, and I'm not breaking any rules, and I'm not breaking any laws. And I'm not necessarily saying that I have a problem with having a glass of wine once in a while as long as it's within the confines and the boundaries of, of the law. But I am saying when you're asking yourself, well, so at what point can or can't I? I want to explore this a little bit more because Jesus actually addresses that in Luke chapter 10 in the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? So you can just pop that in your notes if you want to go back and reread that story because that's what the people are asking right there. Like, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus launches into the story talking about who our neighbor is. And it's people that are created in the image of God. Going on, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, so literally anything that you do, do all to the glory of God. Paul isn't giving us some sort of an exit. He's not giving us some sort of an out where, except for these things, that's okay. Literally everything that you do should be done for the glory of God. Give no offense. Give no offense to Jews, to Greeks, and he's addressing Romans here, okay? So he says, don't give offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Nobody. There is no group of people, whether you like them or you don't. Sorry, Corinth, Greece, not Rome. Correct that. Um, So whether you're Jews or you're Greeks or it's the church, whatever it is, you are not to live in a way that is offending them regardless, Um, just as I try to please everyone and everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So the first point I really want to talk about tonight is the what. Um, We're going to see the what and the why and the how as we're unfolding the text tonight. So Paul first says what is helpful. So if you'll read with me verse 23, it says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And then if we look back in chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says something pretty familiar. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Don't cause someone to stumble. Now, and when Paul is writing this, he's talking about fleeing sexual immorality, but the same principle applies. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Now, we have a slogan that we use at the women's house. I'll give credit to Lindsay Hamilton for it because she kind of coined the phrase. We have no-goes and for show-goes. And so we spend a lot of time unpacking personality types and love languages and apology languages. And so the for show goes are the things that are always going to be a good thing with this person. So for me, it's dinosaurs, it's glitter, it's my family, and it's some sort of a really sweet caramel vanilla latte thing. Hot, cold, doesn't matter, right? Those are on my for show go list. Also, just talking about scripture and Jesus, like I could launch into whatever at any time. And when I read something really cool in my office, like take off running, trying to find someone willing to listen. The girl's like, okay, I'm going to class. I'll catch you later though. Um, So those are my for show goes. But then the no goes are those things that are guaranteed to rile us up, right? It's that thing that we really have a sensitivity for. And it's been a really great source of conversation for us in the house because, and the girls post it fairly publicly, so I was like, hey, this is this thing that, like, if we're going to talk about this, you know I'm going to get pretty passionate and riled up about it. And so if you don't want to go there, or if you really want to respect me, we're not going to go there. So it's kind of interesting because there's actually one of these, and it's not necessarily a no-go, but it's something that is really, really close to the heart of God that we see in Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones, so he had like gathered these kids and they're like, hey, who's the greatest? He says, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. And I can imagine when they asked the question, they were kind of like, hey, so like who's the greatest in the kingdom? And they're expecting some like really like cool answer. And instead Jesus is like, well, if you cause someone to stumble, it's better that you drown. Cricket, cricket. 
Like, obviously, this was something that Jesus really was passionate about and that he had an intensity about. Romans chapter 14, verse 13 through 21 is awesome, also addressing this subject, but we're just going to hone in on verse 15 and verse 21. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. I think that that wording is so interesting. Like, is what you eat really more important than this person that's created in the image of God? Is your desire to eat that delicious, awesome thing or to drink that really satisfying thing more important to you than this person that is created in the image of God that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life for? It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. There is a quote by Pastor Todd Ingstrom, and he says, A missionary is someone who sacrifices everything but the gospel for the sake of the gospel. And I absolutely love that quote. So I want to ask you guys tonight, are you motivated to do what is helpful, which also might mean abstaining from something that is not helpful? The second what that we see is what builds up in verse 23. Another page. <clears throat> all things are lawful, but not all things build up. And then if we see in chapter, uh, or verse 31 and 11, 1, he says, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. See, love builds up. When it comes to Christian liberty, we are to practice restraint and humble deference. I forgot to turn my page. That's why that was redundant. I think of examples of people. So have you ever seen someone where they make a decision or they do something and it completely unravels their life? I was trying to look for examples of this, but almost all of them were completely inappropriate. So I'm not going to do that. But you've heard stories of people who have put out a tweet, right? And whatever they said was so outrageously offensive or self-centered or whatever that, I mean, they lost their job over whatever they said. Um, or an Instagram photo or a status that they made. The thing that I found in common when I was looking at all of these different things that people had done that they'd put out on the internet or whatever was that they had a lack of value, care, or respect for others because they were putting themselves first. Whether it was their need to be seen as funny or their need to be seen as important, or their need to be seen as the authority, or their need to be seen as valuable, or for their opinion to be the right opinion. They were putting themselves first at great cost to others. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We're told to motivate and encourage one another. I love Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir one another up. So motivate each other. Stir one another up to love and good works. Not neglecting meeting together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Proverbs 18, 21 talks about speaking words of life and not words of death. James chapter 3, verse 10 talks about blessing and not cursing each other. The way that we speak to one another really matters. Because if we're tearing each other down instead of building each other up, it's not enhancing the kingdom, it's not glorifying God. And I get jokes and I get humor. But is all of that in an effort to, to further the kingdom of God? Then we see a third thing that Paul talks about, and is what is selfless and self-controlled down in verse 24. But he also re-echoes this in chapter 6, verse 12. And again, it's the same context of fleeing the sexual immorality there. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And man, that's so counter to our natural nature, isn't it? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. I don't know about you, but when I have been obviously waiting for a parking spot and somebody steals it, I get kind of angry, right? Or when other people are just inconsiderate drivers, oh man, 
I had to do some repenting this past weekend when I was in Tennessee. I had forgotten that they were literally the worst drivers ever. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know how long it takes to back out of a parking spot all the way and then put it in drive and pull forward. It literally happened four times in a time span of 10 minutes that these people were just like, back up, oh, not enough, not quite enough, sit here for just a second, maybe put it in park to make sure that I'm doing things right and then put it in drive. Okay, I guess I can drive forward. Oh my goodness. But the root reason that that actually infuriates me is because I'm like, you think that you're that much more important than everyone else, that you can take your time because I was in a hurry to get to my parking spot? I don't know. I mean, it was a little justified because it was a little ridiculous, but at the same time, am I actually looking at that person as though they are more significant than myself? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I want to pause for just a second here on the idea of a living sacrifice. Um, Jim Elliott, some of you may be familiar with the name. Maybe you know who he is. Um, he was one of, I think it was five, possibly four, missionaries that went to South America um, to bring the gospel to the Aka Indians. It was in like the 1940s. They had this awesome plan. Um, there's a really great film called The End of the Spear if you want to watch and see their story um, and, and what happened. Um, but they are people who really put it all out there as far as loving others more than themselves, even at the cost of their life. Um, because the Indians, they, they came out, they were scared, they didn't know what was going on, and so they killed all of these missionary men. And later, Nate Saint's wife took his family to the same tribe that killed her husband. And in fact, the man who speared her husband is the one, he became a believer and he later baptized the son of the man he murdered. Jim Elliott said, if we are the sheep of his pasture, remember that sheep are headed for the altar. And man, that quote really gripped me. We talk about how we wanna be sheep and we get this idea that like, they're gonna have this really long prosperous life, but sheep's purpose was to be sheared and then to be sacrificed or eaten, right? So if we want to really be sheep, we're supposed to live a life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul goes on in Romans and says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And if you don't know what that is, then jump back up to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4, because that's a pretty good description to me. So I want to ask you, are you controlled by selfishness, so that need for you to be first? Are you controlled by an awareness of your liberty, your rights? Well, I have the right to do this. I can do this. I want to do this. Or your desire? Or are you motivated instead and controlled instead by a selflessness and a self-control? The last point in this category is what isn't offensive. And Paul tells us in verse 33 to sacrifice liberty. But he also mentions this in chapter 8, verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul was willing to literally do anything in order for someone to know Christ. So the next thing I want to chat about is the why. The why is for the glory of God. We see this in verse 31. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Because it's about him. It's not about us. And that means that we need to value what he values. And he's kind of crazy about us. That means that we need to value others. Colossians 3.17 also says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Matthew chapter 5, 15 through 16 says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's for the glory of God. The way that we live our life is for the glory of God. We're to live visibly with boldness, not apologetically, but also not offensively for the glory of God. Also, so that others might be saved. In verse 33, 
just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. 1 Corinthians 9.19 says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant at all, of all, that I might win more of them. Jim Elliott had another quote, and this one I thought was pretty awesome too. He says, Father, make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ and me. And that's my prayer for you guys, that you would live in such a way that when people know you, when, when you talk with them, they hear about Christ and that they're forced to make a decision because of the amount of Christ that they see in you, because of how brightly your light shines, that you wouldn't just be a mile marker on the road where people are like, okay, cool, that dude's a Christian, but that they would be forced to make a decision because of Christ in you. Do we live like the gospel actually matters? Do we live like hell is actually a real thing? Am I motivated by the salvation of others? And what am I doing to pursue that end? Am I willing to get uncomfortable? You see, Paul got really uncomfortable for this. Jesus certainly got uncomfortable for this. And I want to ask you, are we willing to get uncomfortable? Are we willing to bring up not just Jesus, but his crucifixion and his resurrection? Are we willing to bring up not just heaven, but also hell? Are we willing to have real authentic conversations with people about the gospel? And that brings me to the last category, and that's the how. And the how is pretty simple and also pretty challenging. It's to imitate Christ. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And back in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, he says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Yes, Jesus was offensive, but he served and lived out of humility and selflessness, not selfishness. If our offensiveness is because of the selflessness of the cross, that's one thing. But if our offensiveness is because of our selfishness, that's an entirely different thing. 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We say that we abide in Christ, then you need to look like him the way you live your life. 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we need to become like Christ, but the way that we become like Christ is because of the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We imitate Christ by knowing Christ. It's about relationship. So I want to wrap up tonight asking you and telling you God cares how you live. So there's this fancy like $3 word sanctification and basically it's the process of being made into the likeness and image of Christ. And it's not a comfortable one. Someone who tells you that you need to ask for your money back because it's not a comfortable one. It is natural to want to turn away from things that are uncomfortable and to shy away from things that are unpleasant. If the sun's in my eyes, I grab sunglasses or I look away. If I try to touch something and it's too hot, I pull my hand back. But God's saying, I need to conform you to the image of my son. And if you guys ever want to take about seven minutes out of your time, there's a great video on YouTube called God's Chisel by the Skit Guys. I've shown a lot of you the video. A lot of you have probably seen it at another time. It's also kind of hilarious because Skit Guys. But it also really brings to light the idea that we want to be in control of how we conform to the image of Christ, right? I'm okay with chiseling these areas of my life, but let's just not touch those. I'm not ready to deal with those yet. And I want to ask you, are you willing to let God conform you to the image of his son on his timetable, not yours? Are you willing to get uncomfortable for the sake of conforming to the image of Christ? The struggle to imitate Christ is the reason we often fail to live in a way that is reflecting him. And it's because of selfishness and a lack of self-control. These are the two root causes of almost all sin, and their parent is pride. That has been the key sin from the beginning, and it will be to the end, because we think that we know better. 
So I want to challenge you guys to be thinking about how do you need to live differently in order to build up and encourage your fellow believers? How do you need to live differently to glorify and honor God? How do you need to live differently in order to live selflessly instead of selfishly? The worship team is going to go ahead and come up, and they're going to close this out tonight. And um, while they're doing that, I just want to encourage you guys to take some time for reflection. And if you would like to talk after Catalyst or you want someone to pray with you, um, the officer team and the staff have committed to hang around because we want to not just leave you hanging with this and then just be like, okay, peace out. You're good to do this on your own. We want to actually walk through this together to practice what Paul is saying and to actually build each other up. Will you bow with me? Precious Father, God, I want to thank you so much that you don't leave us out on a limb. Um, When you call us to conform to the image of your son, you're going to be right there with us through the entire process. And God, I thank you that it's not impossible because it's possible through your son. Um, God, I want to thank you for the example of selflessness that Christ lived, the example that Paul set. And Father, I ask that we would be motivated um, to live in a way that is is a fork in the road um, so that people have to make a decision about you, Um, that we would desire a deeper and more intimate relationship with you for your glory. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.